Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to part three of our video guide to Drakenheim, where we're going to focus on session one of your campaign and getting started. Just note this is a video for the DMs only, so do not show this one to your players. And if you haven't checked out videos one and two yet, one being how to create characters for the world of Drakenheim, and two being how to run a session zero for your Drakenheim campaign, you should check those out first. Now that you're getting started with your campaign, we're going to go over what it looks like starting the campaign at level 1, and what it might look like starting the campaign at level 3. Either way, the beginning of your road to Drakenheim is going to broadcast a lot of the information about what the campaign setting entails to your players. And we want to make sure that we hit the right notes and tell them what's going to happen to them and all the dangers that await them in the horrible ruins of Drakenheim. During the campaign, one of our stretch goals was the introductory adventure, The Road to Drakenheim. And this is the perfect place to start if you've got a group of first level characters that need to get a couple levels under their belt before they head into the ruins of the city. And it's also an excellent way to introduce the world and things like contamination, the haze, and the mystery of Drakenheim in an organic fashion, rather than just giving your players an info dump in the form of a handout. I really like what we've done with the road to Drakenheim, even if you have a group of players who are a little more experienced. If you feel like you want to start at level one, this can be a really good way to to explain the setting and all the things that are entailed within it. The Road to Drakenheim sees the player characters as hired guards for a cart that is on its way to Emberwood Village to deliver some goods. The cart is being ridden by an NPC named Aaron Marlowe, who is a talkative NPC who can explain some of what's going on in the area to the characters, as well as ask them questions about why they took the job, allowing them to maybe explore their personal quests and their character development. In terms of world building, one of the really cool elements that the Road to Drakenheim tells the player characters is that this is a world where the kingdom and law are starting to fall apart. Aaron Marlowe needs the player characters to help them get to Amberwood Village, and they're just bringing regular trade goods like food and water and everyday supplies for the people that live there. They're worried about the bandits that are on the way to the road because there's no one really guarding the road anymore. And those goods are needed by the people of Emberwood Village because Emberwood Village is just on the edge of the haze. Crops don't grow there anymore. All the water is contaminated. So the village relies on these trade goods just for its mere survival. Aaron Marlowe is the perfect NPC to explain this to the characters, and making Aaron Marlowe a talkative sort allows you to have a back and forth with the player characters. Starting off with a little bit of roleplay can really get everybody warmed up into who their characters are, why they're on the adventure, and what they're setting out to do. But as well, Aaron Marlowe can talk about what is known about Drakenheim, the continent of Westmar, Illyria, Caspia, the bandits on the road, the monsters in the haze, possibly even stories of horrible mutations and people who have gone wandering into Drakenheim never to return. This is the perfect time for Aaron to explain those legends and lore and mysteries to really start getting the hooks in for what Drakenheim is going to be about. But of course, Aaron Marlowe has never been into the ruins of Drakenheim themselves. Perhaps they visited Drakenheim when it was a living city, but if the player characters ask if Aaron is willing to go into the ruins, they say, no, there's no amount of money that you could ever pay me to go there, but there's plenty of good coin supplying people who are willing to. Along the way to Emberwood Village, there are two encounters that you can use to help again flesh out the world of Drakenheim. The first is the Bandit Shakedown. A group of bandits are hiding out in a farmhouse nearby and occupy the road to shake down travelers who are on their way to Amberwood Village. With the bandit shakedown, this again helps show the lawlessness of the area, the crumbling kingdom, and the fact that there is nobody really holding the law accountable in these parts. A group of bandits on the road would be less of a problem if Drakenheim hadn't fallen. And the people of Amberwood Village are pretty much fending for themselves. It means that bandits are a pretty regular thing. And having a group of bandits threaten the party is a great way to show this. Now, of course, this is also a fantastic way for your player characters to bust out the swords and spells and get that combat encounter that everyone wants to have in session one of any D&D campaign. 
Of course, combat isn't the only solution to this problem, and this may be one of your first opportunities to highlight to the player characters that they have other options. They could buy off the bandits, they could threaten them or trick them. Allow your player characters to deal with the problem however they see fit. They may ask questions about the local authorities, in which case Aaron Marlowe could mention the Hooded Lanterns are the remnants of the city guard, but talk about how they don't do things like prosecute criminals and they're stretched thin. This is why Aaron needs the player characters to help them get to Emberwood Village safely. This also introduces a possibility that you could start talking about the various factions in Drakenheim. The bandits maybe could be representative of the Queen's Men, although they don't have to be. Mentioning the Hooded Lanterns as the local authorities, or even having the bandits say that they don't care about the Hooded Lanterns, is a great way to bring them up. They're, they could be tied to any of the factions that the characters are interested in, and if any of the bandits survive and run back to Amberwood Village, perhaps they know somebody who is a representative of one of the factions, and this is your first option to be able to have a situation that the player characters deal with come back later. If the bandit captain escapes and you gave them a name, maybe they come back later to threaten the party with a bigger group of goons. As the journey continues after this bandit shakedown, really take your time to highlight to the player characters the landscape as they come into Drakenheim. Tell them how as they get closer and closer to the city, they can see the signs of contamination and decay all around them. The vegetation falling apart, dead trees, fallow fields. Really use this description to highlight the atmosphere of Drakenheim. If you want to, you can even mention the octarine glow on the horizon in the direction of the city. Nevertheless, the characters are going to need to camp out for an evening before they reach Amberwood Village, and this is where the night on the road encounter can come into play. Another adventuring party leaving Drakenheim on the road decides to stop by your camp for the night. They have an injured friend who isn't feeling very well, and they need a place to rest and recuperate. Aaron offers this other group a bit of food and the option to stay with them. But as the night goes on, the ill member of the other party gets worse. This adventure is suffering from eldritch contamination, and over the night, we're going to fudge things a little bit and have their condition worsen so that they transform into a monster, a delirium drag, who immediately attacks one of their former companions. Not only does this give us another opportunity for a combat encounter, but this encounter gives us a, a chance for the player characters to A, encounter a failed adventuring party on the run from Drakenheim, and B, encounter, get their first taste of the dangers that await them in Drakenheim and the consequences of becoming contaminated. This may be a relatively simple combat encounter for a group of even level one characters, but it's not meant to be difficult. It's meant to allow them to flash their swords out, kill the drag relatively quickly, but more specifically, see that a regular adventurer going into the ruins of Drakenheim can turn into a monster themselves. This is where you can open up the conversations about haze, delirium, contamination, and monstrous transformations. Witnessing all of this firsthand is a really great way to show the party just what could happen to them if they aren't careful in the ruins. This is also a good opportunity to give your players a little bit of a taste of what the rules of Eldritch Contamination are, to recap them, or share them with them for the first time if you haven't done so already. We think it's really important for the player characters to have an understanding that this is out there in the city. And so once again, this is your opportunity to get a little bit more metagamey with this, open up about the rules and explain how it works so that they know what the dangers are as they head into the city. Now, of course, there's a couple different ways that this encounter could go down. It's possible that the player characters could detect the signs of the mutation as the adventuring party comes into the camp. It's possible that they might try to talk down the mutated monster that results. That's not going to go so well for them. And, of course, you also have a great opportunity to narrate a suitably horrific and gory monstrous transformation. You could go a lot of different ways, like having the other adventurers who are with their, their companion who is transformed not be willing to accept what has happened to them. So attacking and killing them might confuse and frustrate the other adventurers, having them draw swords on the party as well. Of course, 
this might not have to result in blood, but rather a conversation involving what has happened and what needs to happen. But there's a lot of interesting role play and dynamic options here. So be open to exploring those and see what your player characters decide to do with their first encounter with Monsters Transformation. One thing to be careful for is Aaron Marlowe has done this run a few times and might be very capable of hiding in their cart. And we probably shouldn't try to kill Aaron Marlowe with the Delirium Dreg. In both possible combat encounters, you may want to choose to focus attacks on player characters or the other NPCs rather than targeting Aaron Marlowe. It's a little brutal to run the first thing that way. Again, if you've got really experienced players and you really want to be rough on them, you could go for that. But that's one of the areas where you could, might create more problems for yourself if the players then fail to protect Aaron Marlowe. As your characters venture towards Emberwood Village, Aaron Marlowe also is the first friendly face that they really have. So keeping Aaron around allows the party to follow Aaron into Emberwood Village, be introduced to other NPCs, and get the lay of the land and start broadening the world of Drakenheim. One way to make Aaron Marlowe a very endearing person to your player characters is really play into their chatty and conversational nature. If Aaron Marlowe is fascinated with the player characters, they'll want to share a couple details of their own history, personality, backstory, or personal quest. So this is a great opportunity to take to really introduce everyone's characters in a very organic way. Aaron Marlowe shouldn't be judgmental of the characters, but should be enthralled with the stories that they're telling, interested in who they are, and asking more questions to dig further into their characters. For groups that aren't really into role-playing, this simple back and forth and getting excited about each other's characters, and even some banter that might open up between the player characters themselves, learning about each other's personal quests or personality traits, bonds, ideals, flaws, could be a really compelling way to start building those relationships and getting the party united. The Road to Drakenheim makes for a wonderful introductory game session, and once you have your player characters just on the cusp of Emberwood Village, that's a perfectly fine stopping off point for your first game session, depending on how much time they take in role-playing and getting organized, or with the combat encounters. Whether you make the road to Drakenheim just your first game session or your player characters manage to get through most of that so you want to continue on, Emberwood Village is their destination and the next stop on their adventure. You may want to have your player characters level up when they arrive in Emberwood Village and spend their first night there. Or perhaps you want to give it a little more time and not level them up until they're setting out to the city of Drakenheim. Either way, they should be level 2 when they set out to explore Drakenheim for the first time. But arriving in Emberwood Village, there's a lot to do and a lot of people to meet. So keeping track of everybody is going to be very important and expressing the options to your player characters and seeing what they want to explore and engage with in the town of Emberwood Village. But first, make sure you take the time to set the scene of Emberwood Village. You may want to share the map of Emberwood Village with your player characters that has the important locations marked out, and as you do, describe to the player characters what they see. For Emberwood Village is a place of contrasts. In the one sense, the outskirts of Emberwood Village are almost abandoned. There are many empty cottages, empty homes, the, many of the roads are poorly maintained, and there is a sense of slow collapse over the entire town. But as you get to the heart of Emberwood Village, it comes to life once more. The market square of Emberwood Village is bustling with activity all around Caravan Court, and the sacred flame still burns in the chapel of Emberwood Village, and there is a hustle and bustle around the various taverns, and other businesses located in Emberwood. As you're painting the picture of Emberwood Village, describe it as a rough place, but still a safe place. There might be bandits in one of the taverns beating each other up and throwing each other out a window, but that doesn't mean that the player characters are necessarily in danger every step that they take in the town. They might meet some thugs from the Queen's Men, or some pilgrims of the Falling Fire on their way to Drakenheim. Either way, as they move through the town, you can describe these different groups of people hustling and bustling about. It's also a great time to showcase maybe rival adventuring party. There's a lot of people who might come in and out of Drakenheim and stop by Emberwood Village to sell their wares or buy better gear for their next foray into the ruins. Of course, as your player characters go into Emberwood Village, they're going to have a couple key questions right off the bat. 
Where can we stay? Where can we buy gear? And where can we get healing? Aaron Marlowe is your perfect mouthpiece to give your player characters some advice on where to go. Aaron Marlowe can actually mention that Emmerwood Village doesn't have a proper inn as such. The former manor house of the Reeve, Costa Stavros, has been converted into the Red Lion Hotel, but the player characters might not be able to afford to stay there. Instead, Aaron Marlowe recommends that they check out the Bark and Buzzard Tavern, where Karen Allsberg might be able to hook them up to stay in one of the cottages that has been abandoned in the city. Of course, the player characters might just want to knock back a couple pints of ale, and they can find that at the Bark and Buzzard, but they also could go to the Gilded Lily, or even the Skull and Sword if, they look, if they're looking for somewhere a little bit rougher. If your player characters are looking to buy adventuring gear, better equipment, or health potions and magic items, then they need to go to Caravan Court. Just off the Caravan Court is the Crow and Sun Smithy, which sells many forms of weapons and armor. Or they might explore Elman Gainsbury's cart, which sells basic adventuring gear, or if they're looking for something a little bit nicer and more high-end and magical, they might talk to Eldor the Immense, a character that they're sure to come back and visit many times as they observe his magical wares and get their eyes on something that they're probably going to want to save up for. Aldo the Immense is one of my favorite NPCs who has been a centerpiece merchant in many of my own campaigns, and I'm so thrilled to share him with you. You want to get down into your chest and really bring back your face and let your belly stick out as you roleplay this very excessive and magnomious sort of character. Of course, Aldo the Immense may be a provisioner of weapons and armor, but he is one that will not take any sort of swindling or bargaining. Believe me, you are getting the price that I would give to my very own grandmother. Algo the Immense is an NPC that your player characters may come to many times over the course of the campaign to purchase magical weapons, gear, and possibly even trade some delirium. This is one of the key things to really emphasize with Emberwood Village, though. When your player characters are buying things here, you gotta highlight the scarcity of items here in the town and the savvy of the people of Emberwood Village. The people in Emberwood Village know what happens when adventurers try to swindle them. They get walked over. They don't make deals. They don't give discounts. They don't make bargains. And if the player characters ask for one, they say, well, you can shop somewhere else because there isn't anywhere else to shop. Adventurers love to pull things with merchants, and that might fly in other campaign settings, but not in Drakenheim and definitely not in Emberwood Village. Your player characters are going to try to sweet talk the merchants. They might try to steal from them. They might try to swindle them. They might try everything in the book to get that magic sword for just 50 gold pieces. But be firm. Part of the amazing thing about Emberwood Village is that it is an adventuring town. It's a town where the people are used to dealing with this kind of, frankly, BS, and they don't put up with it. If your player characters do cause problems in Emberwood Village, if they do get on the wrong side of the law, well, there isn't anyone here to enforce the law. There's no guards per se. The Hooded Lanterns might step in. But what happens? The people of Emberwood Village just don't do business with them anymore, and there isn't anywhere else for the player characters to go in the campaign. And so if your player characters do cross someone, they're not going to be able to use them as a resource anymore. The NPCs are very specific here in Emberwood Village for this reason. If they steal from Aldor the Immense, well, there might be serious consequences from that, and Aldor will definitely hire rival adventurers to come after them. So make sure that you ca capture this balance. Of course, if your player characters also start asking for insane equipment, like explosives or comprehensive mining gear or cannons. This is a perfect opportunity to, to highlight that you can't get a lot of things in Emberwood Village. They cost a lot more than typical gear in other larger cities because everything has to be imported. So if your player characters have a strange request for expensive or particular gear, just roll a couple dice. It costs that many times more than it normally would and it takes that many weeks for that gear to be imported in. And of course, the player characters are going to have to pay in advance for it, too. Keep in mind that with the scarcity of items, Elder of the Immense's wares are rare and interesting artifacts that there is only usually one of, and he's the only person selling it. 
He's a great resource for magic items, and most of the other people in Amberwood Village are just selling mundane adventuring gear and equipment. So Eldor is the port of call for magical items. He might also sell some potions, but there are a couple other options for potions and possibly even some healing. Eldor's not much of a healer, he just likes to make money. But let's talk about some of the other NPCs. Characters can visit Flamekeeper Hannah at the Chapel of the Sacred Flame in Emberwood Village. Flamekeeper Hannah is one of the few people in the, in the town who can cast cleric spells. So she can heal player characters, cast lesser restoration on them, and she can sell them a scroll of revivify if they have got the funds for it, as well as healing potions. Flamekeeper Hannah also does know the purge contamination spell. So if later in the campaign the players get contaminated, they can seek out her help. But once again, she does not give discounts to adventurers. She uses the funds from casting the spell to help fund the caravans that supply essential resources to the people of the town. Your player characters could also visit Old Zoya, the druid at the Shrine of the Old Gods. It's a little bit more interesting of a character, and there might need to be some negotiation on how they are going to get the healing or the purging of contamination, or possibly purchasing potions or scrolls off of Old Zoya. But nonetheless, this is an NPC who is open to helping the player characters. But like all things in Emberwood Village, the town needs to continue to function and flourish, so there's usually a price involved for anything that Old Zoya is going to offer. Your final tool in introducing your player characters to Emberwood Village is also having them visit, visited by the precocious Emma Crow, who does offer to show them around the town for a gold piece. This is a really good way to just take your player characters from location to location, tell them what they can find there, and prompt them to interact with the NPCs and merchants of Emberwood Village. As your player characters are exploring the town, finding out which bar is their favorite, and settling down for the night, Allow them to roleplay, interact with NPCs, learn about the people in the town, possibly join in on some of the fun downtime activities that each of the locations in Amberwood Village provides, as well as hearing rumors. On page 19 of the book, there is a list of possible rumors that could be heard by player characters. Certain barkeeps or interesting NPCs might have something interesting to let the player characters know about, or they might overhear conversations regarding one of these rumors in one of the taverns. My goal generally through the road to Drakenheim and through the explorations in Emberwood Village is to make sure that each player character gets to find one or two rumors at this stage of the campaign. I find that having a good quantity of rumors right off the bat really gets the player characters thinking about what's out there in the world, but you do want to keep a couple rumors in reserve for future use as well. Some of the most important NPCs that you are going to meet in Emberwood Village are the faction lieutenants. Each of the faction has one or more lieutenants that usually occupy a space in Emberwood Village. Again, Emberwood Village is neutral ground, so there's not usually a lot of battles or war between the factions here, but the player characters can be introduced to the different locations they can go to, the different groups of people that they might experience, such as Blackjack Mel and his bandit thugs at the Skull and Sword, or possibly a group of pilgrims by the old farmstead, the Hendricks Farm, who are there with Nathaniel Flint, or maybe the old watchtower just outside of Emberwood Village where the Hooded Lanterns and Ansem or Petra might be staying. The player characters can also find River of the Amethyst Academy staying at the Red Lion Hotel, and they'll also meet Ophelia Reed, the Flamekeeper of the Silver Order, if they head to the Chapel of the Sacred Flame to visit Flamekeeper Hannah. At this juncture, it's just important that your player characters get the chance to meet or see each of the factions and their lieutenants so they know a familiar face. If the player characters are looking for work with any of the factions or looking for information from them, Right now, the faction lieutenants might size them up carefully and might just say, hey, you look like you're new here. Show us that you can survive in the ruins first, and then maybe we'll talk. It's possible, though, that some of your player characters might also have some personal quests to pursue that have got them looking for the factions already. And this is a great opportunity to grease the wheels 
and get your player characters into their first exploration in the city. Choosing your personal quest might mean that one of your player characters already knows a faction lieutenant, or perhaps a random NPC who is a member of one of the factions. There's also a chance that somebody is from Emberwood Village, in which case they might already have a place to stay. Feel free to explore and open up the beginning of their personal quest by showcasing the NPCs that they might know. This can be a really interesting way, again, to bring the party together, to get them talking about who they know. If there's more than one player character who knows somebody from a different faction, you're going to want to introduce those NPCs early and have them be a reliable resource to bring those factions into play in your games of Draconite. Before you run this session, you'll also want to check your player character's personal quests to see if there's any opportunities for rival adventurers. I think it's really important that when you are running Emberwood Village to be prepared to run a group of rival adventurers or two, perhaps, so that you have them to play off of when your player characters are in the village. Rival adventurers are a perfect place for your players to get that conflictive energy out here rather than have that uh, happen against a faction agent which could create problems for them down the road. These early conflicts with, with any rival adventures are really, really perfect, whether that is just drinking games, beating up old rattle can, or even just having a bit of a bar fight. A great way to finish off your first stay in Emberwood Village is to have those rival adventures goad the players into venturing into the ruins. A lot of the NPCs that they talk to early in this adventure, including the rival adventures, might be calling them, oh, you're just new here, you don't know what it takes in the ruins, you've never even been to Drakenheim. And this is a perfect way to lead them towards their first expedition and their hunt for delirium in the ruins. NPCs at Caravan Court, like Aldo the Immense or Armin Gainsbury, can talk to the player characters about collecting delirium. Possibly even River from the Amethyst Academy might offer to buy some of the delirium that they find from them, and the challenges of rival adventurers and other NPCs can prompt them to launch their own expedition. Setting this framework and getting your player characters to independently decide to just head into Draconheim to find delirium is a great way to cap off this, the, their explorations of Emberwood Village. It's possible your player characters might be a little bit more hot to trot on a more concrete adventure. If this is the case, you might have them meet with Ansem or River about going to the Rat's Nest and going right into that adventure site. Or perhaps they meet with Blackjack Mel or Nathaniel Flint or Ophelia Reed about going to the Chapel of St. Brenna. This is a good place to begin if you are starting your campaign at level 3 and the player characters just want to dive in right into a structured dungeon environment where they can kind of get all that steam right out of them with their explorations and combat. But if you wanted that more slower introduction over the next couple levels, Delirium Hunt is going to get your player characters up to level 3, and then they'll be able to get to the point where the faction agents can offer them a quest. So with all that, you should be ready to run your first few adventures into the world of Drakenheim, exploring the road on the way to Drakenheim and the little town of Amberwood Village. This gives your characters a base of operations that they are going to return to time and time again. For every foray into the city, they must be prepared to venture back out. And they need a safe place to stay, and there's nowhere better than Emberwood Village. This is going to be a great place where they will get to know all of the NPCs very well, explore downtime activities, meet with rival adventurers, and get to know each other and all of the people that occupy the great world of this campaign setting. So stay tuned for part four of this series where we're going to talk about exploring the city of Drakenheim. So thank you so much. And we'll see you next time in, in the Dungeons, Dungeons of Drakenheim. Drakenheim.